Hello, my friends. Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. Wearing my Kamita t-shirt. This uh, company uh, belongs to my former Italian exchange student. Uh, he was an exchange student here his senior year in high school. And he is now grown with a couple of kids and inherited the company from his father. It's a biofeedback uh, technical company, the only one where the biofeedback works underwater for swimmers and things like that. So, uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Got a little late start. Not because I overslept. It wasn't that at all. I just kind of lost track of the time and was got immersed in something else I was doing. But uh, we made it and we're here uh, relatively on time. Uh, I, before we get too far into it today, I'll remind you that if you have any questions, comments, or topics you want me to talk about today, uh, be sure, or you want to just call my attention to something, just put three question marks in front of it and put it in the comments section there. Just be sure to put the question marks there. That draws my attention to it, and I can find it much easier. We're going to be in Mountain View, Arkansas, October 19th through the 22nd, bar any, barring any problems. And I told you the problem could be that my buddy Gene, you know, could throw a wrench in that. He has terminal cancer and uh, he's fighting. He's down to his uh, final days, unfortunately. He's really suffering, I think. Um we had, as of this morning, we had 99,136 subs, <laughs> so uh, we're crawling up on it there, just a little over 800 uh, subs to go to get there to the 100,000 mark. Uh, we're growing at a rate of 2,332 subs per 28 days, which, that again, that increased a little bit also. Uh, the title of the video says that uh, there was a thieving squirrel stole my walnuts. If you saw in the, yesterday's vlog, I pulled the walnuts out into the uh, driveway. And of course, I couldn't get the camera on quick enough to catch him actually stealing it. But, you know, when I realized what was happening, he, it was already too late. So the clip starts with him already having stole it and he's out in the field. And then as soon as he hears me talk, he takes off. But here's the little clip anyway. I thought it was kind of cute. You see that squirrel? He has just stolen one of my walnuts. Can you see it in his mouth there? Now, of course, when I turn the camera on, he has to run and hide. Yeah, he picked it up out of the driveway. He didn't, you know, he couldn't pick up one of the other walnuts. He had to pick up the ones that the holes were already knocked off of. See, he's no, he's no dummy. And so he picked up that walnut and he ran out there in the field, which is weird. I don't know why he ran all the way out there in the field. That, that actually seems uh, completely backwards com normally because they typically like to stay in cover and stuff, you know, because the big old hawks and even eagles can fly down and grab them if they're out there in the middle of the field like that. So uh, I was just surprised that he did that. But uh, anyway, I thought it was a kind of a cute little clip. Um, let's see. Uh, right after, you know, I mentioned yesterday that, you know, we've really needed rain. Well, I guess it worked because uh, right after we hung up uh, the uh, call or the vlog yesterday, um, it started raining. And uh, it rained, you know, not hard. It was like a, what I would call a heavy sprinkle, and it lasted about three to four hours. So that was good. I mean, it wasn't a rain exactly, but it was a good heavy sprinkle. And uh, it got the ground pretty good and soaked, at least on the surface. And it wasn't hard enough to run off, so that's good. It always soaks in better that way. But, uh, I, you know... You know how it is. You always want more. And if we could have got eight hours of that or 10 hours of that, I'd have been even happier because it was just the right amount of rain coming down to do really some good. It just we needed it for a longer period of time. So, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned I also showed in a recent clip that I had redug out that one water hole uh, for the horses. And I, I didn't go back there yet to see if any water, uh, you know, went in there. I kind of doubt it would make any difference, cut the kind of rain we got. It wasn't enough rain to really run off. So I really doubt that that pond has any water in it yet. But I will go back there later today. And if it does, I'll show you that tomorrow. Um, 
the mandolin that I had been working on, I finished it up yesterday. I went ahead and took the strings back off and uh, leveled out the frets a little bit more, cleaned it up, played real well, uh, notified the customer. I also stabilized the crack that was in the back. I didn't realize it, but that crack had opened up a little bit, and uh, so I just stabilized that with some CA glue, uh, taped it off real good, filled it with CA glue, dyed it uh, to match, and uh, it looks pretty good. Actually, I'd say it looks better than it did. Um, still, you know, you can still see it, obviously, because it was... But anyway, it turned out pretty nice, and I did notify the customer, so that one's on its way out of here. It's, it's going to be a, few, a little while probably before it leaves, but uh, anyway. And then, uh, you know, uh, several uh, vlogs ago, and I don't remember how many, if it was, you know, a week, 10 days, two weeks, I'm not sure, but I showed you the pumpkins that were growing in that tree over by the creek, and uh, here's the harvest that uh, Sue got off of that, uh, off of that tree. Well, I'm running a little late this morning getting down there for my vlog. Those of you who remember the pumpkins growing in the trees, well, those are the three pumpkins. Now, why they're different looking, I'm not exactly sure. But those are the three pumpkins. The reason I know for sure is this one here has a limb right there. That's where the limb was pushing against the pumpkin as it was growing. But I thought that was kind of interesting to have pumpkins growing in a tree. Never saw that before. Nice morning this morning. The temperatures are not bad. It's not too cool. It rained quite a bit yesterday. Uh, right after we finished the vlog, it started raining. And I would call it a heavy sprinkle. And it did that heavy sprinkle for about two and a half to three hours, which is really good you know you always want more i wished it would have done that for about eight or ten hours but uh but we'll take what we got maybe you all can tell if the trees are changing on the colors i you know i would say they are just based on the time of the year and what I can see, but I really can't see those subtle differences. We'll give you a look at the trees here as we're going down to the shop. It's a little overcast, a little darker this morning. I'm hoping we'll get some more of that sprinkling rain today. Be really nice. So you be the judge. Are the trees changing? Really, honestly, can't say. The uh, while I, while that was playing, I noticed someone ask about my uh, fret recrowning file, so I went over and gathered that up, and I'll show you that here in just a minute. Yeah, I I thought it was uh, pretty neat to see pumpkins, you know, growing and then literally hanging down on a vine uh, in that down tree the tree was laying down if you didn't get to see that earlier on the tree was had been cut i cut it down uh and anyway there was a compost pile near there and these seeds sprung from the compost pile and then vined over into the dead tree that was laying down and Sue noticed that there were pumpkins hanging down from that pumpkin vine. So apparently that was two different vines because there were two different kinds of pumpkins there. So anyway, pretty cool, I thought. Uh, you just don't see that every day where pumpkins are growing in a tree. <laughs> um, just thought I'd mention to you that, um, you know, Kind of like this, and then the smelting furnace, and then the uh, laser level that I got, the Lasgu laser level. Um, more and more companies are contacting me all the time, and a uh, company with a fairly large product contacted me over the last couple of days and confirmed yesterday they are shipping me a product. I won't mention what it is yet because you never know, it could be a hoax or something for all I know, but. Uh, if it turns out to be what it is, it's pretty cool for, from my perspective. And I'll show you that in a later video if that does actually surface. Um, but anyway, there are a lot more companies contacting me. I mean, a whole lot more. And uh, 
I have turned down nine out of 10 of them, uh, mostly because they just don't fit what I do, you know? I mean, it'd be kind of like them, well, as a matter of fact, a couple of them were some kind of food products. And, you know, you know me and my taste buds, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hype some kind of food if I can't eat it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, there's so a lot of that green stuff, you know, I forget what you call it now, but there, you see it on other channels, you know, um, I forgot what it's called. You know me in names. I can't remember. But anyway, it's like, there's no way I can, <laughs> there's no way I could drink that or eat that or whatever it is. So I'm not, you know, I turn down anything that I can't, you know, stand behind. Uh, there, uh, there's just no way I'm going to try to fake something like that. I gave Cash his music lesson yesterday, and uh, he, you know, it's just, I think it's funny, ironic, whatever you want to call it, uh, coincidental even, that his first name is Cash, and of course, we're teaching him a Johnny Cash song, and uh, so he's he's planning to, whenever he does this uh, live, to say, hello, my name is Cash. And, you know, for a 10-year-old boy, he's got a very deep voice, so he, he could probably pull that off, which is, I think, kind of cute. But uh, he's also doing pretty well with it. But, you know, I, I uh, you know, and I might be a little hard on him. I might, I just, you know, I mean, I probably am, actually. But I will not accept anything less than, you know, perfect timing and or, you know, when I say perfect timing, I don't mean by the metronome, like tick tock tick tock and now, of course you got to have that too but everybody pretty much on the planet will over time maybe speed up just a tiny bit through the song i'm not worried about that kind of time i'm worried about the kind of time where you miss a beat you don't come in at the right time uh you cut across and leave out notes uh those are the kinds of timing things that are obvious as heck um And, you know, the other kind of time, the amount of speed and all that, you know, sure, a metronome and all that will help with that. And, and, you know, I'm not knocking a metronome, but that's not exactly the kind of time I'm worried about. I'm worried, more worried about the kind of time where, like I said, it's the real obvious break in time or the obvious leaving something out, cutting the corner, that that kind of timing. There's all kinds of timing. Uh, Yeah, many more than that, actually. But uh, that's what we're working on, and he's still struggling with that a little bit. There, especially on where he has to sing and then switch to playing, uh, playing lead, and that kind of thing. So he's having some fun times with that. And uh, I, I'm, you know, I have to be honest. I'm beating up on him pretty good. I, you know, I'm really in- insisting that he get it right. And, and part of that is that th- this young man, you know, more so than most people. He forms a habit in a heartbeat. I mean, like if he if he does it wrong once, he's going to do it wrong in that spot every single time from then on. And so I really have to watch it so that he doesn't do that because he will, you know, he he locks in. And it's uh, habits are way harder to break than it is to learn it correctly from the beginning. Um, you know, I learned that in archery. I learned that in all kinds of things. I've told you before, you know, that I taught archery and it was so easy to teach somebody if they didn't know anything at all. But if they had already formed their habits, wow, way harder, way harder to teach them. So anyway, that's going well. And uh, one of these days, hopefully before too long, we'll get him to perform his uh, Johnny Cash song. But it still may be a few weeks yet because he's still struggling with uh, little little pieces of it. And I want it to be as good as we can get it before we, you know, put it out there on the air. Um, <clears throat> today, my plans are to create a video about this. Um, you know, it, that was the deal. They send this to me and I make a video. I just have been busy. And, uh, but today I should have time to make a video on this. And I'm going to try to think of some creative ways to use this. If you don't know what it is, it's a voltage tester. Basically, it just senses AC voltage. And this one gives you a percentage of how strong the voltage is, which I think is kind of cool compared to most of them. Most of them are just a dummy light or just a dummy vibration. This has the light and the vibration, but it also gives you a percentage, which I think is a step above most of the other testers and sensors, which I think is pretty cool. So if you guys, even right now, can think of any ways or ideas of how I might test this and include it in the video, feel free to add your comments and I'll 
try to incorporate it if it if it works for me, if it's something I can do. Um, so that's one of the things I plan to do today. The other thing I plan to do today is that mandolin again that I just finished. I'm going to start editing the video on that and try to get that done uh, so that we'll have that for the weekend. And already I'm disappointed in that video because I was I really thought I was very very careful about keeping all the video content on that together but I can't find the first piece of it and it, I don't think it's any big deal it unfortunately it was showing it would have shown removing the fretboard which it starts the video right the parts that I have right now starts with the fretboard already off and that's kind of a bummer because I, you know, I may have to recreate it or show what I did or something like that. I, I don't know. It's just very frustrating. I really thought I had all the video clips, but I cannot find that. And, you know, of the thousands and thousands of videos I put out, I think I've only lost footage once or twice. And wouldn't you know, it would, one of them would be on this very last, excuse me, the very last instrument that I'm working on. Just kind of that typical Rosa thing. <laughs> and I, I swear to you, I, I was consciously trying to keep all that together. I really was. That's probably the reason it caused a problem. I was thinking about it too much. Um, so anyway, those are the things I'm planning to do today. Um, we will have our shop talk tomorrow. And uh, shop talk is not very much different than our vlogs at this point. But shop talk was more geared to be more technical that was the original idea and that you could ask your technical questions about working on instruments and and even and at this point it can be about working on almost anything i mean i really do have a lot of experience working on almost everything really um from air conditioning to plumbing to you know xylophones I, you know pretty much i yeah, I don't mean to say I'm an expert because I don't think I'm an expert in any one thing, but I do know quite a bit about most things when it comes to physically working on something. So if you do have an idea or a question or a problem that you, you know, are looking to get answered, uh, let me know. Um, and by the way, uh, Zoom calls, uh, I'm, I'll be doing a Zoom call today at about 3 o'clock with someone from California, I believe. And they're asking for help with an instrument that they're about ready to tackle. And they want me to look at it uh, on Zoom and give them some suggestions and ideas. And the, the, just the basics on that is I do the Zoom calls uh, up to 40 minutes for uh, $50. So, you know, and then if it's less than that, we'll adjust that $50. But the, the point is that it, you know, up to 40 minutes, which is the maximum Zoom call you can make on the free account, um, it, I charge $50 for the maximum there. And, uh, you know, if so, if you have some technical aspect on an instrument or something like that, and you really do, you know, want a one on one opinion, and we you can show it to me, and I can tell you what I would do and how I would do it, that's basically what's going to happen this afternoon at three. Well, I think that covers everything I was planning to cover. So let's go back to the comments. Um, it says it's on top chat again. I'm going to switch it to live chat. Doesn't seem to make any difference at all, except for the fact that it moves that little banner down that divided where the before we went live and the after we go live. It, now I don't know where that fell. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the first comment came in from uh, Thomas Armstrong, and I'm sure this was before we went live. Um, he's got, it says, uh, less lettuce. A mandolin playing cartoon character based on your life experiences. <laughs> Always saying this or that sucks canal water. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> no, I think that sucks canal water, Thomas. <laughs> no, I don't know. That is, yeah, it would be cool, but yeah, getting that done is, uh, yeah, that's, out, that's slightly above my pay grade, I think, on that one. Ken Solo says, good morning to y'all. Carolyn Fikes out there. Again, I think most of these were before we went live. Looking forward, as always, to what Jerry has to share with us. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, my thoughts on lettuce. <laughs> Let's see. Gary Smythe from the UK. Good afternoon from a cloudy Barnsley in the UK. 
Um, Gary Smythe again has a question mark there. It says, Jerry, have you ever thought of writing a book semi-autobiographical to include guitar repair tips, etc., and include photos of your beautiful farm? And yeah, um, Gary, actually, I have thought about writing a couple of things, but yeah, thinking and doing is two different things. And you know, I I have written lots of documents in my life, lots of them. Most of all of them were for Bell or AT and T. Uh, a lot of those documents were in the hundreds of pages, and uh, most of those were technical documents about the systems and things that I designed. And and you know, uh, pretty much they left it up to me just to design it however I felt fit. And uh, most of the time, you know, the designs went off without a hitch. I think I told you guys this story a long time ago, but it's a true story. You know how. When they leave you alone to let you do your job, it usually works out just fine, especially if you're competent and know what you're doing. And that's kind of the way it was with me. They kind of let me just do my thing, even though I had zero training in system design. Zero, none, not any at all. Never went to school for any of it. Never took a computer class in my life. I just learned it on the job, figured it out, and took off and ended up kind of running a lot of it. Not, you know, I wasn't the top dog, but I was you know, an important piece in the, in the puzzle anyway. So, uh, one time <laughs> they, they had just given notice, you know, my system was efficient and it had changed a lot of things and it was cutting out jobs basically, which, uh, you know, a lot of people were not real happy about that. Of course, when your job's getting cut and, you know, I wasn't necessarily proud of that myself, but on the other hand, that was my job was to design an efficient system that would be easier to use and, and to save time and, you know, money, the whole bit. So I did that. Well, now, you know, several years into it, now they're going to cut out, I think, like 10,000 jobs, something like that because of this. So they just gave these people their notice, right? And then, then they, the, the, up, the mucky mucks up above, they, they call me into a meeting and they say, we want you to, to uh, put a, uh, a foot on the screen and, and, uh, and, and we want you to put the slogan, take the extra step. And I said, guys, I don't think I'd do that right now. You just announced you're laying off all these people, you know. And, um, <laughs> and, and he and I said, you know, that's going to look like you're giving them the boot, putting that shoe on there. I said, I just wouldn't do that. I, that foot on there, you know, I said, I wouldn't do that. Oh, no, no, this is a campaign. This is a you know, nationwide campaign we're, we're doing. Take the extra step. They were talking about customer service. You know, that was the idea behind it. But the timing and the idea just didn't go together, in my opinion. So I said, no, guys, I, if I was you, I wouldn't do it. I really wouldn't. I, I'm advising you against it. I'm, I just want to be clear. I would not do this. No, well, well sorry, we're going to override you. you. We need you to do that. Okay, I'll get it released this weekend, you know. So I told, we, I got with the programmers and everything, told them what they wanted and said, put it on the screen. And I told the programmers, I said, trust me, be, Fix this where you can take it back off because I'm pretty sure we're going to be taking this back off. You know, I had 100,000 online users, you know, and I pretty much, they had their finger on me and I had my finger on them. I pretty much knew what was going on with them and they pretty much knew what was going on with me. So that released over the weekend. I am not exaggerating at all. When I, it just so happened, it was so coincidental that I just happened to ride up the elevator with one of those big shots. I forget, it was a division manager or somebody. And, uh, you know, we're chit chatting about our weekend, you know, that kind of thing. And we get off the, uh, get off the elevator, the elevator door opens and I can hear a lone phone ringing and I can tell from the elevator, even though it was quite a ways away, that it was my office <laughs> and it wasn't stopping. It was ringing solid and I'm not kidding you. And so, uh, so uh, it just so happened we were talking. He just went ahead and followed me over to my office. Well, I said, uh, I said, I have a feeling we may have a problem with the system. So, you know, he followed me over there. So I, I pick up the phone. Oh, oh, okay. You don't like, you don't want that foot on there, huh? Okay, I, I got gotcha. you. Click. Yeah. Okay, you don't like the foot either. Oh, you, oh, oh, I see. <laughs> I mean, like the phone was ringing the moment I touched it down, it was ringing. And... <laughs> 
he goes, oh my gosh, I guess we better pull that off. <laughs> so I, I sent the note to the, or I called the uh, programmer and I said, hey, pull that back off. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. I knew it. It was just black and white obvious, but you know, you just can't tell some people some things, you know. Anyway, uh, that's a true story. Um, poly, uh, okay, so moving down through here, there's a lot of more comments, but um, Paul Akers has a question mark there. It says, can you show us your fret crowning file and what brand is it? Well, the brand, I don't know. I got it from Stumac, so you can find it on Stumac's website, I'm sure. I don't. It doesn't say any particular brand or anything on it. Um, but it's uh, got the replaceable uh, 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 files, I guess is the best word. And this is the real small one for the mandolin frets, the little tiny frets. And then there's a medium one for, you know, some guitar frets and things and banjo frets and things. And then there's the really big one for guitar frets. Uh, the larger guitar frets and so you can replace you know it's replaceable and I like this one now quite honestly some people would probably find this one the hardest one to use because um, you know it's just the least little bit of tilt and things it'll come off your fret so you got to be careful with that but I think any of them will do that now they make them in other styles uh, I didn't think about that and I should have put that out to see if, see if I can find it real quick but I don't know if I'll find that or not. Yeah, I think I did. No, I didn't. Well, I know there's another one here somewhere that I, I just can't... Well, here's one. It's similar. It's not the same. But th they make them like a regular file that look almost like a regular file that have these grooves in the sides like this too. And then here, you know, so this is, this is similar, I mean, to that regular file. But this one says Fret Guru. Someone sent this one to me, and quite honestly, I don't know that I've ever really used it much. Uh, it looks like a good file, though. It looks like it would work really well. Um, but uh, anyway, the point is that, uh, you know, I like this one because, you know, it, it interchanges with the three different sizes, frets and stuff. Now, on this big one, I... Uh, I uh, took it over to my sander, actually, and I uh, ro rolled off the outer edges. Not, not the part that's cutting down inside, but I rolled off the outer edges because those edges stuck down so far that they would actually, you know, especially if you try to tilt this a little bit. See, like, I like to tilt it. I don't like to just go straight across the fret. I like to go on the side and on the side and on the side and on the side and do it that way versus taking the top of the fret down. I do not want to take the top of the fret down because that's your level, you know, and if you change your level, then I don't care if you change it by two thousandths of an inch, which is something you can barely see, um, you're probably going to get a buzz from that. Because uh, once that fret gets level compared to relative to the other frets in their area, that's where you're going to get your buzz. Uh, it's going to buzz on the next fret back if that fret's lower. So, I, so it's critical in how you use a fret leveling file, in my opinion, recrowning file, is that you don't knock the top down. And that's where, you know, I guess you're less experienced or your people that are super careful, which I really want to think about it. You could put your magic marker on the top of the fret and you want to, you know, leave that, you want to leave a fine line of that magic marker right down the top because if, you, if you're taking that off, you're lowering your fret. Um, so anyway, that's how I do it. I like to round them. And then that's why I also then take the sandpaper and go this way. And you would be amazed how fast that sandpaper, like 600, 800, rounds those frets also and gets rid of the burrs and all that and makes them look really smooth and polished. Almost mirror polished, not, not mirror polished, but really polished. Makes them much smoother, much faster, and it do you don't have to worry about knocking one particular fret down. Like if you take the sandpaper and you go like this on one fret, what are you going to do? You're going to be knocking that fret down. So I like to do it that way. I really do find it's much, much faster for one thing, but it also, I think, I really believe it does a better job. I really believe it. I know you'll talk like a Dutch uncle to convince some people of that. They just, they've got the traditional ideas and they've learned the traditional way. And the only way they can do it is the way they do it. And, you know, fine. If that's the way you feel, feel free to feel that way. I got no problem with that. My point is that 
the way I do it, the way I've shown it in my videos, you will find works really well and it works really fast and it gives you the least amount of trouble and um, you will get the job done a lot simpler, easier, with a lot less stress on yourself. And, uh, and it will make the frets much smoother and much rounder quicker by taking your sandpaper going that way. The negative of doing what I do is that you do then have to clean the fretboard in between the frets. You're going to have to do that. But the positive of that is that it, by the fact that you sanded it, you'll see all the flaws in the fretboard. And you'll know right where to take the flaws out. And, because there will be flaws in your fretboard. And by, so, I mean, it's, it's good, it's bad, it's good, it's bad. You know, that kind of thing. It's, there's trade-offs with all of it. But anyway, that is the fret recrowning tool I have always used. I do like it. I have, I've ended up wearing some of these out and bought new replacement pieces. And I bought those from Stumac as well. Um, so, you know, this one might be just as good. Uh, that I, for me... The negative of this one that I can see right off is that it's a really deep groove and these little edges are going to rub, you know, on, down on your fretboard and they're going to make a crease down on the wood. And just from what I can see, it does look like it's two different sizes. This one looks a little bit bigger than this one, but they're not that much different. And I, I prefer being able to select the specific size I want to use. So anyway... That's the name of that tune. I hope that helps you. Obviously, more than you were planning to hear, but that's just the nature of the beast with me. Um, it doesn't do me much good to tell you part of something. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I feel like I'm doing you a disservice if I say, here's what I use, just get you one of these. I could say that, but uh, I think there's more to it than that. Uh, Bill Dedrick. Do you know or have you played with Greg Blake and Todd Davis? Bluegrass guitar? No, I don't. I don't think so. From Missouri? Well, I don't think so. Now, a lot of times I just don't know the names. I mean, I've jammed with a lot of people from Missouri, but honestly, I those two names don't sound familiar right off the top of my head. Gary Smythe from the UK, where is your friend Gene's cancer? I am fighting prostate cancer myself to, uh, so may I wish anyone out there suffering all the very best. Yeah, well, thanks, Gary. I, uh, yeah, it's, it's terrible. He, his, uh, what's really different about Gene, you know, he's in his 80s now, and he's been the picture of perfect health his whole life. I mean, he really has. He never gets sick. He just just works hard, and, you know, he's he, he's not a big guy. He's, he's kind of um, a, a little bit shorter and just, you know, uh, just looks healthy. You know what I'm saying? He just looks like a healthy guy. And this knot grew up on his leg, and it's a, it was a big knot. I mean, the size of a baseball, you know, and it came up on his leg like this. It was huge. I mean, just looking at it, just you take your breath away. And um, so he had that surgically removed um, at, um, I think, Barnes Hospital, which is one of the big hospitals, pretty much nationally renowned type hospital. And uh, anyway, he had that removed, and he he did. I'm not kidding you. He didn't even take a pain pill. He never did. Never took a single pain pill. He said he never had no pain. It was no problem. And they grafted, you know, from one leg to the other and everything just to fill it all back. You know what I'm saying? And and it wasn't long after that. I mean, you know, I mean, he's it's been that's been three months ago, four months ago. I don't know, something like that. But it wasn't long after that, well, another knot came up, not too far from there. And uh, then he started coughing, and now it's in his lungs, and, he's, and it's really bad in his lungs. So it, and he's never been a smoker or anything like that, so it, it's just one of those deals that it's just moved and got throughout his body, and it's not good. It's really a sad deal because he's, he's always been in such good spirits. He's always been such a happy, healthy guy, um, really friendly, super nice guy. I, I mentioned to you before, he helped me on my baler when we were having real problems with the one baler years ago. And he came out and 
he, he took a soda can and cut a little thin strip of aluminum out and put it in, in a area where there was, where the bushing, I guess, had worn out. And he put that in there to fill the space and man, the baler just started working, you know? And so he knew exactly what to do. And, uh, he also was the one that made me that T-post puller that I showed as a, what is this thing? You know, and the, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, I showed you that. But he made us that too. Just a real good friend. And he's always been a real good bluegrass supporter. So I'm really sorry to see him, you know, suffering like he is. It's, it's, it's terrible. No, I, you know, it's, we're all going to die, but it's how you get to that end, you know. And he's been so happy and healthy his whole life and to have to have so much agony and pain now um the uh the uh, he had one radiation treatment and apparently that did not go well and uh you know it caused all kinds of pain and trauma throughout his body and really created all kinds of pain and problems all over his body according to what i've been hearing i haven't actually talked to gene about that but um Anyway, it, it didn't go well, and they decided they're not. He decided he's not going to have any more radiation. So, it's you know it, the days are numbered. Um, the days are numbered. Um, moving down here a little further. Um, uh, John Cunningham, J. W. Cunningham from Eastern Forest of Texas. I've been watching and enjoying your channel for several years. Keep it up. Well, thank you, John. I really appreciate you watching. I really do. East Texas is forested is what he says there. <laughs> well, I, I didn't really know that, but it uh, wouldn't surprise me, I guess. Uh, let's see. Uh, down a little further. There's a few more comments about good morning, that type of thing. <laughs> Gary Smythe says, it's not uh, forgetting things, it's remembering things. Yeah, that's the problem, is trying to remember, that's for sure. Um, okay, uh, now, the, I guess, I don't know, it, this is, at least from this point down, is after I changed it to live chat. So I, I, uh, I don't know what the significance of that is. I still cannot see a difference. I really don't know what the difference is. Dan Lucas says, uh, hello from Brazil. Well, hello. It's uh, ni nice to have someone here from Brazil. Uh, Carolyn Fike, Jerry, I'm a writer editor and I'd love to help you write your story for free. I'm a published author. Well, cool. Very cool. Yeah, I, you know, I, I've actually started writing a few things. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> Believe what you want, but uh, it was probably 20 years ago. I started writing a book called The Theory of Everything. I didn't get very far, I'll be honest with you. Um, and uh, it, I really did. I This was before I heard about the modern theory of everything. There's people that have a book out now, you know, the scientists, the astrologer type people, uh, you know, the I forget what you call those guys, astrophysicists, whatever, and they've got this theory of everything, you know, with the string theory and the whole bit. But I was writing theory of everything according to me. But uh, I, eh, I just, it just didn't, I don't know, I just got tired of messing with it and set it aside <laughs> never to get back to it. But uh, it would have been a different perspective, you can bet. Um, so uh, thanks for that offer, Carolyn. I, I, Carolyn, I, I really don't know if I'll ever do that or not. But Michael 2X, hey, Rosenmeister, when you uh, going to start the foundation for the water wheel project? Well, I'm just kind of waiting for the weather to cool off and for me to quit procrastinating, pretty much. Um, yeah, I don't know. It'll be not too distant future. I'm going to try to get to that. Uh, but I'm, I'm dreading it because you know, the, for the same reason, when I first started it, it was the same problem. Where that spring comes down through there, it's just a swampy, muddy mess. And I really need to build a wall right in the middle of that. I really do. And that's the problem. And I just, I don't even know how to approach it. It's just a mess. It really is. And it's going to be hard to build that wall. And that's what I got to do. I got to build a wall right there or it's just not going to work. 
Um, <clears throat> Mike Sab Saba says, uh, Jerry, do you adjust a truss rod with string tension or not? Um, <clears throat> you want to determine, you want to make your determination whether you need to adjust your, ten uh, your uh, truss rod with string tension. In other words, you want it tuned up to full pitch. This is me. I know I'm different than the rest of the world. I don't use a ruler. I don't use anything. I just look down the fretboard. And if I see a big underbow, well, then it needs adjustment, you know. And um, I like to see them where they just look pretty dadgum flat. Now, I know that the technical gurus that know everything will tell you you need to have 10 thousandths relief. Well, I kind of disagree with that. I, I don't think you need to have it. I think it's okay to have it. Uh, I don't think you have to have 10 thousandths relief. And, and my experience says you don't need it at all. But I go with that because I know I just get in all kinds of arguments if I don't. Um, so if you got a slight, teeny, tiny amount of underbow, you're fine. But it better be teeny and tiny, and it better be where you really have to look to see it. Because... From one end to the other, 10 thousandths is almost nothing. It's just a couple of sheets of paper. And that's not much. And that's all you want. You don't want any more than that. And actually, in my opinion, uh, the relief or underbow, whatever you want to call it, I think creates more problems than it fixes. I really believe it 100%. I'm not just saying that to be dramatic. I'm telling you I believe it. Because if you just, all you got to do is draw it out on paper and... You know, your, your bridge is back up here. You've got your neck hump, you know, because your neck slants down. Well, there's a hump there. there. There is on almost every instrument. And where your neck starts to slant down, there's a little bit of a hump there. And if you think about the fact that you've just lowered the, the neck now in the... Now you've got, you got that hump you got to go over. And, and you just lowered the middle here because of your relief. Now, granted, it's only 10,000. It's not very much. But if, if, if you just stop and think about it in common sense, you've created more problem there because you got more relief. Where if you kept it level and flat, you're going to clear your hump a little bit easier. So just keep all that in mind. You don't have to go, you don't have to agree with me 100%, but just keep that in mind. And uh, anyway, so the question was, you know, again, it's one of those deals where I can't just answer the simple question because there's more to it than that. The question is, do you adjust it with tension or not? You want to verify that you need to adjust it with tension on there. So let's assume you need to adjust it. You've got way too big an underbow. Well, then you do want to release all the tension on your strings. Otherwise, you're, you've got two opposing things fighting. And that's not good. Um, it, it'll cause you to either strip out your truss rod or break your truss rod or something. I mean, I'm not saying it will every time. And I know gazillions of people have done it under full tension and it's not caused a problem. But it's not a good thing. And it, again, just plain black and white common sense will tell you that you should take the tension off your strings before you try tightening a rod like that because you're working in opposite directions. Now... You know, it takes some experience to know how much you need to tighten it. Um, but just the seat of the pants explanation is, if you've got a pretty big underbow, you need to tighten it quite a bit. Um, if you just see the least whisper of an underbow, then maybe a turn, a turn and a half, you know, uh, or even a half a turn might be enough. I mean, it's really... It can be very significant, and on a particular instrument, it can be a lot different. Then you really need to string it or tighten it back up, tune it back up to pitch, and look at it again and check it again. And if you need to use a straight edge, feel free. I don't have a problem with you using a straight edge. I just didn't feel like I ever needed a straight edge. I can look down it and tell, and I can put my finger on the high fret or the low fret or anything. I can all, I've can i been able to do it since day one, and I don't have a problem with that. And I can prove that to anybody who doubts that. You want to come here and I'll prove it on camera. If you think you can, you know, if you think you can fool me, just come right here and we'll do I That's my challenge to anybody out there who says I'm full of, you know, whatever by making that claim. Because I can do it. I've done it a gazillion times. Um, so the point is you just, you know, adjust it with no tension, but make your 
make your judgment with tension. And then you'll have to string it back up, get it tuned back up, check it again. If it still needs adjustment, you got to release it again and do it. Now, you don't have to make it super, super uh, released. Just a couple of turns on every string will probably be enough tension off of there to make your adjustment. So, you know, you don't have to take the string completely loose. It's just to be clear. That's my take on it. You ask, and I told you. So there you go. Um, okay, now, you know, I, I didn't see this one before. So Chip Wood's comment there, I didn't see it before, but it came right after Carolyn's offer to uh, help me with the uh, book. Um, Chip Wood has one, so I'll go back to it because uh, I sure didn't see it before. Any persimmon trees on the farm uh, for preserves or jams or jellies? Yeah, we do have several persimmon trees. In fact, one of the biggest one and probably the best one is right in our backyard. And uh, it makes a nasty mess. And uh, Sue has never, ever pursued it. Um, uh, I don't know why exactly. I'm, You know me. I'm, it's not going to be me that's going to pursue that. It would have to be Sue. Um, but, uh, yeah, we just never have. I don't know why exactly. Um, the uh, only thing I ever did with persimmons when I was a kid, of course, I tried to taste one, and you know how that'll make your, that'll pucker you up tighter than anything when you, <laughs> you can't even talk after you taste one of those green things. Um, but uh, the only thing we ever did with them was put them on a pointed stick and then throw like that, and then that persimmon would go nine miles out there. And the, I mean, you could throw those things forever. You could throw them out of sight almost. Um, but anyway, that's what we used to do with persimmons. Uh, then Michael 2X, uh, he asked about the foundation. I did that one. And then we got to Mike Saba about the truss rod. Okay, so moving on down. Um, Northy Land's talking about uh, he got kidney cancer at 50, had a kidney removed, doing well, 52. Well, good. God bless you. I hope it works out really well. Like I told you, my wife had uh, colon rectal cancer, and it was bad. It was really bad. And she went through heck for a long time. And I can say this with all honesty. I, I've never seen one single person in my life as sick as she was and recovered and lived. She was on her deathbed. I mean, I, I sat up with her most of one night because I just knew she was going to die. And uh, she didn't. And uh, it was amazing. Just amazing. I, I do not know how she recovered. I've never seen anybody that sick in my life. I mean, she was so sick. She had those chemo treatments. And they, they claim that only like 2 or 3% of people have a reaction to that. Well, she had the reaction. And uh, man, it's a case where the, the cure was way worse than the disease. And she vomited and had diarrhea for, man, I don't know, 24 hours. And I mean non-stop. You would think, well, yeah, you'd do that a few times. No, this was just every couple of minutes, throwing up and diarrhea. Oh, it was horrible. It was the worst thing I ever saw in my life. And uh, yeah, but she made it through it. And she, God bless her, she's doing really good now. And I, you know, that, that was more than 10 years ago now. So we just have to see how it goes. Um... Moving on, uh, C90 guy, what kind of food do you like to eat? What is the typical Rosa family meal? Well, the typical Rosa family meal is different than the typical Jerry Rosa meal by a long shot. <laughs> uh, it's easier to tell you what I do eat than what I don't eat. Uh, I eat meat, uh, the three starch vegetables, which are corn, potatoes, and rice. And only if those three things are plain. If you got onions, you know, garlic, anything in there to make them taste good, then I don't eat it. And uh, the uh, I eat nuts, uh, grains, cereals. Um, I like breads, but I'm just not on breads right now because of trying to lose weight. But um, yeah, meat, 
pretty much potatoes, pretty much. And when I say it, I mean it. Like, you know, I've heard lots of people say that to me. They go, oh, yeah, that's the way I am, too. I'm, and then the first thing, we go out to dinner, and the first thing they do is, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll have your house salad. Or I thought you said you were meat and potatoes. Oh, yeah, I just eat a little salad. No, I'm talking zero, not any, not one little piece, not a piece of a green bean, not a piece of a pickle, nothing. Zero, none. When I mean zero, I mean zero, black and white, 100%. And, you know, when I eat like a, say like a hamburger, like from McDonald's or something, if I can, t trust me, I can tell you, you could stack out 10, you could stack out a thousand hamburgers. And the one that an onion touched, I can tell you which one it is. Uh, it, yeah, I'm not kidding you. It's my taste bud is so ridiculously strong. It's not even funny. I've been tested. I'm called a taster. I have, you know, I don't know the numbers, so I'm making this up just so you understand. I'm not trying to say this is exactly right, but it's similar to this. Let's say your average person has a thousand taste buds. I have like 10,000. I have many, many times more taste buds than your average person. And, um, uh, you know, I knew there was something different about me my whole life, but everybody said, he's just a picky kid. You know, he doesn't, you know, and, and, and you go to these family reunions and you, everything. And, oh, you, 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 I made this especially for you. You'll love this. And I said, well, it's got onions in it. Well, you can't taste the onions. No, I said, you can't taste them. I can. And it ain't going down. Sorry. And then you might say, well, what's the problem with that? You know, what, you know just buck it up and suck it down. No, you can't do it. It's impossible. It, the close, I mean, the closest realistic analogy I can give you would be you go out and pick leaves off your trees and eat them and tell me how good they are. It just isn't food. And that's the way that stuff is to me. It's not food at all. It doesn't even sort of taste like food. It is the nastiest tasting stuff. And, the re and you might say, well, why? And the reason is, and this has been tested and proven, I can taste chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is not a good taste, if you can taste it. Let me tell you, it's not a good taste. And, uh, you know, my, my uh, biology teacher was the one that discovered it. He, he you know, he, he tested everything. See, I, I found out I was a genetic defect in that class because I had no clue about any of this stuff. I knew I always had problems in all these areas or differences in all these areas, but I didn't know why or anything. Like he laid out the color charts and all the kids were yelling, you know, there's a 29, there's a 33, and there's a 14, and there's a 7. And I'm looking at it and going, what the heck are you guys talking about? I'm, there was nothing there. It was like me looking at a shag carpet. I'm just looking at that going, there ain't nothing there. I don't see no numbers there. And they're just yelling numbers left and right. And I'm going, where are you getting those? I had no clue. I did not know I was colorblind at that point. I was a senior in high school. So that was the first awakening. That was the first test he did. He did another test where he tested the size of our lungs. And I always knew I could run, you know, and pretty much outrun anybody, especially on distance and things like that. I could just run and never have to worry about any problem. Now, keep in mind, my mom and dad were not into sports, so I couldn't take advantage of any of these weird fluke things that I have. But uh, anyway... Um, you know, when it came time to test my lungs, you know, like these big football player guys, you know, they were on the football team in high school, you know, they, they stand up there and they, they, you have to blow through this thing and displace water. Well, they were, like most people were displacing a bowl, maybe a bowl and a half. Well, they could do two, two and a half bowls, you know, that type of thing. I get up there and I do it and I'm, I'm, I move four bowls of water, more than twice what anybody else could do. And so I have these gigantic lungs. And the evidence of that was when I went out to um, uh, uh, Colorado, or yeah, no, uh, Wyoming. We were at Yellowstone. We were up at that 8,000 foot level. And everybody's going, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I was like the best air I ever breathed in my life. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm, I'm not just saying that to be dramatic. I mean, I'm, I'm like, God, I love this. This is the cleanest, clearest air. I was just loving it. And like there was a, one sign that said, uh, you know, uh, scenic over, uh, falls overlook or something, 900 feet 
elevation straight down, you know, you have to walk down the trail. They warn you ahead of time so that you know what you're getting into. And I said, well, I'm going to go down there and take pictures. And they go, there ain't no way. We can't walk that. I said, no problem. So I just walked all the way down there and I never sat down once, walked all the way down there, you know, and it's like miles of switchbacks, you know, so that you can go 900 vertical feet down. And it was miles of switchbacks. I mean, like, I don't know, at least a couple of miles, I would say. So anyway, I walked all that down there, snapped three pictures, turned around, walked all the way back up and never sat down one single time. Didn't bother me even that much. The only thing that bothered me was I was sweating. But in terms of air or breathing, I had no trouble at all. So I have a feeling I would be one heck of a Mount Everest climber. I just have a feeling I would be. But, you know, that ain't never going to happen. So, and then, so that was, those were the first two biggies that I discovered in that class. And then the third one was the taste test. And I've told you how I did that before too. It, that Mr. Bur uh, Burroughs was the old curmudgeon, you know, he's just a, well, he just looked like an old college professor is what he looked like, but he was a high school, uh, you know, and he always had a lab coat on, you know, the whole bit. He just had to play it up. He was a, a lab technician kind of guy, you know. So he, he walks around and he puts this little thin piece of paper on everybody's desk. It's not litmus paper. I know what that is. It, it was some other little kind of paper. It was kind of an eggshell colored paper. And he laid it on everybody's desk. Didn't say a word about it. Went back up to the uh, chalkboard and he's writing out assignments and different things. And he's up there five minutes, you know, and he turns around and he says, that piece of paper I laid on your desk, put it in your mouth. Well, me being the way I've been my whole life, you know, you know, I didn't discover that I had a taste issue in that class. I knew I had a taste issue, but I didn't know there was a name for it or anything. So I, I just didn't put it in my mouth because just because of me. So I just sat there, you know, and 30 minutes later, he's walking through the class and he's walking back there by my desk and he sees that piece of paper laying there. He's going, hey, did you put that piece of paper in your mouth? I said, no, sir. And he says, uh, put it in your mouth. I said, Mr. Burroughs, I really don't want to. No, put it in your mouth. Okay. I put it in my mouth. I said, oh my God, what is this junk, you know? He's going, you can't taste that. And I said, yes, I can. It's horrible. He says, oh, there's no way. He says, I've been given this taste test for 30 years. He says, I give it to, you know, what, however many classes he has a day, six, seven classes a day. He says, there has never been one single person that could taste it. I said, well, I'm telling you right now, Mr. Burroughs, I can taste it and it tastes terrible. He says, well, if you can taste it, what does it taste like? And I said, um, I don't know. I, I said, I've never tasted anything quite like it. I, I, if I was guessing, I would guess it tastes like sulfur or maybe rotten eggs or something. And he's going, oh, I'll be dang. He says, that's exactly what they said it's supposed to taste like. And I said, well, there you go. <laughs> so, and then I went to my doctor and had further tests. And my doctor says that I should become a wine taster. He says I would make millions. And I said, no, thank you. Uh, I don't like the taste of wine either. So there you go. So it's, you know, it's, I'm just a genetic defect. And then, uh, you know, of course, these crazy long finger hands. I mean, I, my hands are not big like most m big men's hands. They're not like that. I mean, I've met gazillions of men that that could crush my hand, you know, just crush it. I mean, they've just got just gigantic moose type hands. But I've never met anybody my height that has fingers longer than my fingers. Never. Not one single time have I ever met anybody. And I've checked a lot of people over the years, you know. Um, 13 white keys on a piano. Walk up to your piano, put your hand down, and count 13 white keys. Not Don't count the black ones, just the white ones, and see if you can push down 13 keys. Then you'll have an idea. <laughs> They're pretty big hands. And, and, and I've, I've told the story many times. My granddaughter, Mary, the day she was born, she was the second grandchild uh, and the second granddaughter, and uh, the, mom the moment I saw her, I mean, like 10 seconds into it, I go, oh my gosh, she's got my hands. <laughs> and everybody goes, what? And they, they look at her fingers and they were really long fingers. It was really obvious. And sure enough, she could palm a basketball when she was 12 years old. And that's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> think about that so she's got those crazy long fingers and she is one of the basketball stars 
The only other, the, I mean, there's several other things. I got AB negative blood. I mean, I've just got the weirdest things. And the other thing I will tell you that I didn't do anything to deserve this. It's just the way it is. And why it is, I have no idea. It's my legs. And um, maybe that's why I can climb these hills so good. I don't know. And, you know, with the lungs and the legs. But 14-year-old kids are going, wait up, wait up. And I'm just walking up the hill. I don't have any problem with it. Well, on my legs, you know, the, the pushing thing that you do on the weight machines. We had just got a brand new weight machine when I was in high school. And it was at Lafayette. No, I take it back. I think this was, yeah, I think it was Lafayette. Well, anyway, so, uh, you know, on the pushing thing, I couldn't do anything you know, I could barely do what most of the guys could do. I, you know, honestly, most of the guys could do more on the pushing than I could. But the thing where you put it across your ankles and then you lift up, you're sitting back and you actually lift your legs up like that and you're lifting the weight, I'm off the charts on that. I don't know why I'm off the charts. I have no idea. I never did anything to deserve that or make that happen. Um, but I'm totally off the charts. I mean, like they, we put all of the weight they had on the machine on that and you know, that you could direct to that function, which was several hundred pounds. I don't remember. And I could just lift it up. No problem. Not, not even having to strain. I could just lift it. And then, so the coach, he hears that. He, he hears me say that. And I said, I'm telling you coach, I can do it. He's there is no way. And so he walks over there and I pick it up and no problem. He, I said, Coach, I'm telling you right now. And there was a bunch of kids around watching this because it was a confrontation, if you will. And I said, Coach, I'm telling you. And he's 200 pounds. I said, if you sit on there, I can still pick it up with all that weight on there. He's got there ain't no way. And I said, I'm telling you, I can. And so he sits down on it. I just pick it up like that. I threw him right back in my lap. So why I have legs that crazy strong, I have no idea. Just just it's just some i'm just a genetic defect some of it's good some of it's not so good the uh, most of it has like each grant like my kids didn't get it at least as far as i know my son's definitely not colorblind he's definitely not colorblind he can track a deer in the woods you know on a blood trail or something i cannot do that um my uh granddaughter has the giant hands trinian my he's the seventh grandchild Unfortunately, he got the taste. Doggone, I hated that before him. And he's also colorblind. And so is his little brother. Uh, Leighton is also colorblind. Um, and uh, I'm also night blind, as I've told you guys. I, <laughs> it seems so stupid to even say this because people think you just got to be exaggerating. But I'm not. I, my white car parked out here in this gravel parking lot. I have walked past it in the dark more than one time where I've walked all the way across the parking lot, all the way across the driveway and out into the hay field <laughs> looking for my car. And then I can't find it. Well then, you know, then I can tell I'm in the hay field now. So now I have to turn around and I have to walk back and now I have to find the darn building. <laughs> and then I have to walk up to the door. That's how night blind I am. I am completely night blind. It's crazy. It's, it's yeah, I am a genetic defect from where they come from. <laughs> Just fortunately, most of them are okay. They're not like a big, big deal. I'm very fortunate. I'm not complaining. I'm just trying to explain how weird I am. I really am a weird specimen. But the but the food thing, that's probably the worst one of all, quite honestly. Because that, you know, people take it for granted that everybody tastes everything the same or everybody likes the same stuff. And trust me, that ain't true with me. Uh, that's not true at all. Um, how I got that, I have no idea. As far as I know, no one in the family ever had that as far as we know, but somebody must have had it to pass it on down to me, you know. Um, crazy, just absolutely crazy. But uh, my, I can remember sitting at the table um, you know, until 10, 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night, and then go to bed because Dad wouldn't let me up from the table until I ate the green beans or the green whatever it was they had on my plate, you know. And I wouldn't do it. And my brothers would all eat it, you know. My brothers and my sister, they'd all eat it, but I wouldn't eat it, you know. And anyway, it was 
It was a struggle growing up. And the doctors back in the 50s, they said, oh, he'll eat when he gets hungry because my mom said she would sit up at night and cry all night long because I wouldn't eat anything. And the only thing they could find I would eat was mashed potatoes. You know, when, when you get old enough to start eating solid food, you know. So all they could feed me was mashed potatoes and milk until I got teeth. Then they tried meat and, you know, then I would eat the meat. And that was it. And it, so it's from baby. It was from birth. You know, it wasn't like a conscious, you know, it, that's what I think most people think it is. Oh, you're just picky. You just, you just got it in your head that it's that way. Well, why would an infant do that? You know, I mean, an infant is where it started. So if you can't believe it, I don't know what, how to help you, but a lot of people just don't believe it. For instance, I'll tell you right now, Emery doesn't believe it. She just doesn't believe it. I'm saying, well, sorry, Emery, I don't know what to tell you, but it's a fact, you know, it's a black and white fact. Been tested for it, and it's proven. And now that Trinian, God bless him, poor kid, got the same thing. I mean, he, he won't eat nothing either. I mean, zero, nothing, just exactly like me. Which I really didn't, w I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, honestly, because it's just awkward as heck. It's just awkward as heck. You go out to a business meeting and they've catered in this big lunch for you and I just sit there and watch everybody else eat it. You know, it's just terrible. It's just horrible. Um, anyway. Okay, moving down through here. Um, yeah, that was way more than you wanted to know, but sorry about that. Lots of people making comments and about Gene and things. Thank you very much. Yeah, cancer spreading is a really bad situation. Um, Bill Webb. Good morning. Bill's been here quite a few times staying at our rental retreat, and I think he's on his way back again, if I remember it's what Sue said. Glad to catch, uh, able to catch you live this morning. We are also getting some rain and cooler temperatures here in Commerce, Texas. Gary uh, Northy Land says, give this guy a thumbs up. Well, thank you, Northy. I appreciate that. Gary Smythe from UK. Are you saying that the theory of everything finished up the theory of a few things instead? Yeah, I would say it's more like that. Yeah, I just did. Yeah, I've got my theory on everything. I really do. I'm talking from, you know, everything. Just pretty much everything. I, I really do. I, I try to keep those kinds of opinions to myself for the most part, but I was trying to write it in a logical manner that people could understand. Uh, I don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say I think I'm smarter than anybody else, but everybody has an opinion, you know, and I was just trying to express my opinion. That's all it is. Um, Okay, here's a username that I can't really pronounce. J E S C H O forty six. Uh, Jerry Sh Jerry Schofield would love to see you build an automatic wood splitter, one where you put the wood in and it cuts it to length and splits the wood. Well, um, yeah, I built. I don't know if you noticed or saw the videos where I built the one for the front of my bobcat, and quite honestly. That's all I need. I mean, you know, I, I, yeah, I go out and buck it up with a chainsaw. But that doesn't take very long. I can do that pretty darn fast. I'm, and I've got a big chainsaw, and I can do that pretty quickly. But that, uh, the splitter that I have, it splits it four ways. I can, I can walk over to a log, grab it like this, and then I swing around over the dump trailer and split it four ways, turn around, pick up another one, split it four ways, turn around, pick up. And I can do it. Not quite that fast, but pretty close to that fast. So in my opinion, I can split wood just about as fast as one of those processors can. And that's good enough for me. I mean, that's all I need. I don't, a lot of times I don't have to touch the log itself until I throw it actually in the fire. Because um, like I, I put it on my dump trailer and then I just back the dump trailer up to the big wood furnace and just dump it. Cause there's no point in stacking it when, you, you know, a lot, a lot of people are all anal about having a perfect stacked firewood and all this. You'd be wasting your time and you know, wasting part of your life uh, to stack the firewood as fast as we burn it here. A dump truck load will only last a, a few days, just a few days. And so... Uh, Anyway, that's just how I do it, and uh, it and, and my and there are videos out there on my splitter, and it really does work very well. I really like it. 
Um, moving on here. Uh, okay, uh, Michael 2X. My mother died from colon cancer. The Rosenmeister's videos kept me sane while I was her care. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, but glad that it helped. I will always be grateful to the Rosenmeister. Uh, well, thank you very much, Michael 2X. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, my mom uh, died of cancer, too, at age... 57. I think that's right. Or was it 56? I'm getting that mixed up now. But anyway, uh, uh, she came, she was in the hospital. She came home from the hospital and it was Christmas Eve day, the day she came home from the hospital. And the she didn't even go straight home. She, she you know, uh, I think my dad or whoever, my sister, somebody drove her straight to the bank. And she went into the bank because my dad was not good with paperwork or anything like that. All the all the business aspect things, paperwork wise, was done by my mom. And she went straight to the bank the day she got out of the hospital and had everything changed over to the kids' names because she knew she was going to die. And uh, and you know we we you know when I found out about that, I said, well, gosh, mom, you could have waited till you know next week. She goes, no, I don't have that kind of time. And it wasn't. Just a few days later, uh, she died, and uh, she had, um, uh, it was a pancreatic cancer that had gotten into her liver also, I think. Yeah, it was bad. Uh, yeah, that, I tell you, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Gene, he's now going on hospice, and you know what that means. It's just, the end is very near. <clears throat> Let's see, uh, Northy Land again. I grow hot peppers and sweet peppers. My ghost peppers are also ready to harvest. I'm scared to eat one. Um, yeah, though, those stuff like that's just compost to me. I mean, I, 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 it wouldn't be beyond me to grow it, but it, I would just throw it in a compost pile and grow potatoes with it. <laughs> as stupid as that sounds, that's exactly how I would do it if it was if it was up to me. Uh, yeah, it'd be totally different. They, uh, uh, that reminds me of like going to Dickie's Barbecue Pit. Well, I don't eat anything that's really strong. Pretty much, it's just, I say this to be silly, but it's just kind of the truth in the sight, in a way, in that I don't eat anything I can taste. <laughs> that's kind of the, that's just my silly line that I say, but it's kind of the truth. And so, you know, I like barbecue sauce, but... It can't be spicy. It can't have onion bits and junk like that. And it's just got to be mild type barbecue sauce. But their sweet, mild barbecue sauce, I love the flavor of it up at Dickie's, but it honestly is so hot to me that it is so hot. It's a, it puts me on fire. It really does. And I start sweating on my forehead. And, and I'm not exaggerating. You can come there and see, and you'll see me sweating. And I like it. It tastes good. But that's the very strongest thing I can eat and, and get by with it. And I, I'm not kidding you. That's the strongest thing I can eat. And uh, it sets me on fire. It really does. It's, it's not an exaggeration. I'm not saying it to be dramatic. I'm telling you for sure. It sets me on fire. And it's, by everybody else's standards, it's super mild. They can't hardly even taste it, you know. But boy, for me, it sets me on fire. Um, moving down here, uh, trying to get to the last ones. Um, Patrick Spinelli uh, says, We can change from live to top chat on our end. Has something to do with bandwidth security at, let's see, uh, bandwidth security. At 90, I understand, but could you comment I realize it really doesn't concern you that much. I'm not quite sure what you want me to comment on about the top chat and the live chat. The truth is, I don't know nothing about it. That's the truth of it. If I did, I'd tell you what I know, but I truly don't know a thing about that. I didn't even know it existed until somebody pointed it out the other day because it's just something I never looked at. Again, keep in mind, I'm a really bad reader. I've been that way since childhood, too. And uh, so I... It, I typically don't read anything I don't feel like I have to read. 
<laughs> so if I don't, so I don't look around much and see stuff like that. That's my biggest failing with computers is I don't always read everything on the screen. And uh, but if I do, I, I mean, I can understand it. I just don't. But that particular function doesn't seem to do anything for me. When I click on the live chat, all I see it do is it moves the banner down to where the, where we're at at that moment, and that's where it says the live chat is at. But this, the comments still scroll up the screen like they've always done, whether I'm on top chat or live chat. So I don't get the difference. And I tried to look that up. I actually looked it up on YouTube. What's the difference between... And everybody had some weird explanation that didn't make any sense to me whatsoever, and none of them seemed to really know either. I mean, they just didn't. They just were talking to hear their head rattle, I think. Um, all right, moving down here. Let's see. Uh, Blackjack guitar, Michael 2X, condolences, sorry for your loss. Yeah, that's a sad deal. The Dirty Knobs is the username. So you're responsible for the Sahara force being a desert now? <laughs> I don't know what comment I made that made you say that, but hmm. but I'm for the most part I'm responsible for everything from warts to hemorrhoids. <laughs> That's just kind of my other byline is I'm responsible for everything from warts to hemorrhoids. Pretty much that's just me. Um, guys, <laughs> I'm sure I probably bored some of you to tears today on this chat, but uh, thank you so much for tuning in. There are 125 people are still out there right now, and uh, I guess I'll get busy and try to make this video. Nobody made any suggestions on what I should try to do with that, but uh, I'll come up with something creative, I hope. Maybe I'll do like the... Uh, I don't. Did you guys ever see those commercials with that uh, Ernest goes to camp? You remember that er, that guy that I forget his name in real life, but uh, he used to do commercials for our local electric company here, uh, Union Electric. I think they were called. It was in St. Louis. I forget the name of them. I think it was Union Electric. Well, anyway, he did commercials for electric company and different things. He goes, and one of his funny commercials was. Uh, you know, it, it was electric, so this kind of reminds me of that. He 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 was working on a furnace or something like that. He says, "Well, there's a problem right there, Vern." And he goes, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and he's, and he's, you know how silly he could be, and he would pretend he was getting shocked, type of thing. And uh, so that's what this is for: is to avoid those crazy shocks. But anyway, guys, it's been nice talking to you. I hope I didn't just completely bore you to death, and uh, we will see you tomorrow for Shop Talk Bright and Early. Be sure to bring those questions, comments, and or topics, and we'll see you then.